We've all heard in most cases that when someone dies suddenly or is murdered, the significant other is the first person to be investigated. Whether it seems possible that the person died from an accident or a self-inflicted injury, those closest to them are always investigated to make sure they didn't have any involvement, especially when there is a lot of suspicion around the people in that person's life before their death. However, as we will see in today's case, all of the evidence, all of those red flags, and all of the suspicion around Grace's death means nothing to the investigators. All because the person in Grace's life has ties to the community that run so deep that the town is willing to let a possible murderer run loose. But before we get into the case, I want to say a huge thank you to Scentbird for partnering with me on today's video. I've been using Scentbird for years now and I haven't stopped because I am in love with their service. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month for just $17. With Scentbird, you don't have to invest a lot of money on designer fragrances, especially if you find that maybe you aren't too fond of a scent that you thought you'd love. Scentbird has over 700 perfumes and colognes to choose from, plus tons of unisex options as well. Well. They have brands such as Gucci, Prada, and Versace, as well as indie labels like Skylar and Confessions of a Rebel. With each fragrance, you'll get a 30-day supply so you can try out fragrances before committing to a full-sized bottle that can cost you upwards of $150 to $300. So I currently have three scents from Scentbird, and can I just say, I love the packaging. It comes in these sleek, luxury-looking bottles that just look so cute in my purse or when I'm traveling, then you open them and you have this little vial inside that gives you your 30-day supply. First, I have Lenora by Mind Games, which is my current favorite scent. It has notes of passion fruit, tikana bean, freesia, sandalwood, and eco musk. It's such a light and refreshing scent for every day. My other favorite is Seven Summers by Dime, which is another very light, airy scent that is perfect for every day, or I also love it for one wine nights with the girls or date nights and things like that. It has notes of vanilla, champagne, warm sugar, juicy pear, and coconut cream. I love being able to try these scents before I buy the whole bottle online because the ones that I think I'll love online versus what I actually end up liking are different. So I'm glad that I'm not stuck with bigger bottles of scents that I won't end up using. Scentbird is also great for people who don't like to stick to one scent for a long time, which is also something that I do. People who like to switch it up all the time and try new scents, this is perfect for you. I love being able to switch scents every month, find ones that I love. I have found a couple that I'm absolutely obsessed with, but otherwise, it's nice to just have this 30-day vial. It's also great for traveling, so when I go on any trips, I throw one of these in my bag, and I know that I am set. So give Scentbird a try out for yourself. When you click the link down below and use code RACHEL55OFF, you can get 55% off at Scentbird, making it just a little over $7 your first First month. Again, make sure you head to the link down below and use code RACHEL55OFF to get 55% off your first month, available in the US and Canada. Thank you again so much to Scentbird for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic and suspicious deaths of Grace Holland and Sarah Sweeney. I also want to give a disclaimer that any allegations I make in this video or theories that I present are just that. I got much of this information from family members of Grace on their Facebook page, and any allegations I make are based on that information and are my own personal beliefs. 35-year-old Grace Holland was born on September 23rd, 1984 to parents Patricia and Graham Holland. She she grew up in Creevecore, Missouri and had two sisters, one of which was her twin, Laura. Grace was described as a force full of energy and spirit. She grew up going to Catholic school where she was a part of the police explorer program in high school. She then went on to university earning a degree in criminal justice. After that, Grace went on to get married and in that marriage, she had four daughters who she loved with every fiber of her being. 
those girls were her entire world and she put her all into raising them. However, Grace's first marriage did not end up working, so for the time being, she was working to raise those four little girls all on her own. That was until around 2015 or 2016 when she met Robert Dawes, who also had a son of his own from a previous relationship. Robert had an extensive career serving as a firefighter for several years before moving up to being the Maryland Heights fire captain. Robert was known to be very well liked in the community. First responders such as himself work hand in hand with law enforcement and are very respected and honored, especially in smaller communities like the one he was from. But Robert was not the only hero in his family. In fact, he came from a family of many first responders. His father, Robert Dawes Sr., was the fire captain before his son took over the role. His brother, David, had also once been a St. Louis police officer. However, with David, this role didn't last long. He was accused of second-degree sexual sodomy, so before any serious charges were filed against him, he resigned from the police force. But that didn't mean that Robert or his family were any less respected in the area. The Dawes family also owned a local company called Liberty Artworks, which makes memorials for the police and fire departments. As you can see, Robert's connections with the town's law enforcement runs deep, and his family is embedded in that community. This is one of the things that really drew Grace to Robert when she first met him. She had a profound appreciation for law enforcement, being an active member of her community as well. After meeting, the two started a relationship and things progressed from there. On Facebook, Grace loved posting photos of herself, her girls, and Robert, and all of the fun things they did as a family. Eventually, the pair were engaged, and by 2020, the two purchased a home on Conway Drive in Creve Coeur. For months, Grace went back and forth between the home she already lived in on Fairways Drive and their new home, doing different renovations and preparing the home for move-in. However, although those on the outside saw a happy, loving couple, according to Grace's twin sister, Laura, behind closed doors, their relationship wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. Laura said that Robert was controlling and possessive. He wouldn't let her work a job on her own. Instead, he got her to quit her job and started working for his family's business. But she also was not paid directly for her work. Instead, Robert set it up so that he would get Grace's checks and then pay Grace under the table. That way, he could control when she got her money and how much she got. Outside of work, he also controlled all other aspects of her life. He controlled how much gas money she was given. He decided how she would use her spare time, including when she got to see her own children. Through this, Grace lost so many friends, even her best friend, because Robert wouldn't allow her to see anybody without him. It's a classic situation of the abuser keeping their victim away from outsiders to make sure that they are only hearing their words, their suggestions, and making sure that no one on the outside can make Grace aware of the red flags or help her leave the relationship. Then, when it came to the home that Grace loved so much and spent so much time and energy renovating, her name wasn't even put on the deed because she didn't have any of her own money. In addition to controlling her time and money, Robert was also psychologically and physically abusive. He would verbally berate her, and Grace told friends that he would blow up and become angry at the smallest things. By June 9th, 2020, Grace secretly recorded a video where you can hear how Robert talks to her. He is ranting about not wanting to be forced into a marriage with Grace, saying, that he will do anything to spend as little time as possible with her. She tells him that she loves him and he responds by telling her to F off multiple times and saying to get the F out of his house. Now, do I have to plan on you being here again tonight? No. Oh, but well, you said that last night. So now I'll make other arrangements. What do you mean? Well, I won't be here then. Why not? Because I don't want to be around you. Tonight. Why not? I don't want to be around you, period. But if this is going to be some sort of forced fucking marriage, that doesn't mean I have, I can, I can 
strive to spend as little time with you as possible and take every little advantage to stay the fuck at arm's length from you. Every little night I have to squeak an extra hour at Liberty, uh, traffic, uh, flat tire, whatever the fuck I can do to just extend my life away from you is going to be my priority. I love you. I hope you okay. have a good day, okay? Don't any trips. Okay. I don't want to travel with you. Okay. I don't want to see love the you. world with you. I love I don't you. do anything with you. I love you. I hope you have a good day, okay? Fuck yourself. Okay. Fuck you. I hope you get in a better mood. No, this is the mood okay. I'm going to be in. No, you're just trying to be mean to me, and I'm not going to take it. Okay. I love you. Have a good day. Fuck you. Fuck your cunt mother. Get the fuck out of my house. Love you. Have a good day. Um, then we will be selling Conway. Just so you know. So I would work on something, whether it's keeping the kids at Irondale or whatever it is you need to do. So, yeah. Then around that same time, family members started noticing that Grace would show up with bruises all over her body. That same month, Grace confided in her sister that Robert had pushed her and then shoved her down and dragged her down the hall. This caused visible bruises, which family members saw. At this point, Grace started taking photos to document the injuries that she was sustaining from Robert's abuse. In another incident in late June, Grace had called her mother during one of Robert's episodes where Robert was yelling and screaming at her and throwing her things out of the house and into the yard. Her mother, Patricia, urged her to call the police, but at some point in the argument, she heard Robert say in the background, my brothers in blue are not going to do anything to me. I've already taken care of that. You're the crazy girlfriend, remember? So once calling the police was off the table, Patricia urged Grace to at least get out of the house, but Grace said that if she left the house while Robert was in that state, that things would just get worse for her. Even Grace's children were witnesses to the abuse. They would later say that Robert was always losing his temper and always screaming at Grace or shoving her and getting physical with her over the tiniest things. One time, he blew up and started screaming because the couch in the living room was touching the curtains. Another time, he blew up because the silverware was out of place. Literally tiny things that no one should even get upset about, Robert was throwing tantrums over. It got so bad that Grace even contacted the Maryland Heights Fire Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Mark Russell, to tell him about her concern over Mark's behaviors. But of course, that was ignored. Mark is one of Robert's close friends, so that could be why she wasn't listened to and nothing was done. To me, it seems like Robert probably went to work and complained about how crazy Grace was, so anytime she confided in anybody about their relationship, they probably just assumed that she was the one acting out and was making things up about Robert. It got to the point where Grace even started going to counseling to deal with her situation. So that is just what the family was seeing and hearing from Grace. Things were not going well in the relationship whatsoever. But they could not have guessed just how bad things would get until everything came to a head on July 21st, 2020. Not too much is known about that day in general, but in the evening at around 10 p.m., Grace took a selfie of herself and Robert lying in their bed in their new home. They had just been in the process of moving out of their old house and into the new home that Grace had worked so hard to renovate. In the selfie, she's smiling and appears to be in a decent mood. However, by around 5 a.m. on July 22nd, 911 received a call from Robert to report that Grace had shot herself with a gun inside their fairways home, so not the home that they were in in those 10 a.m. selfies. She was now at the other home that they just moved out of. Now, they did also have multiple guns within their home due to their jobs and the fact that both were trained with firearms, so Grace used one of those guns to shoot herself. In the call, Robert sounds very, very calm and collected. He is very matter-of-fact when telling the dispatcher what happened. I will play that call now. 911, location of your emergency. Uh, two, three, fairway circle. Two, three, fairway circle. Yes, ma'am. What's going on? Uh, my fiance just shot herself. Shot, your fiance just shot herself? Yeah. Okay. 
she, okay. she, she, it's a mortal wound. Okay. I'm a captain with the fire district with Maryland Heights. Okay. She, okay. She, um, she okay, let me connect you over to Central County, okay? Hang on one second. Mm -hmm. Sir, are you out in St. Charles, or is that where she's at? No, Creek 4. Creek 4. Okay. 623 Fairway Circle. Oh, I'm sorry, 623 Fairway Circle. Okay, is that a house or an apartment? It's a house. Okay, what's the emergency there? Uh, my fiance shot herself. She shot herself? Where did yeah. she shot herself in the head. It's a mortal. It's a mortal injury. I'm a I'm Captain with Marilyn Heights. She's on the Okay, sir. I, I'm sorry. So she is yes, that's correct. I just need an office. Obviously, with this call, literally within the first second, I was surprised at how calm Robert was when speaking about his fiance, who he supposedly loved, shooting herself. We know that everybody reacts differently to tragedy. We know that some people are very calm and sort of detached when something like this happens. We also know that he is a first responder. So people with stressful jobs where they see things like this happen on a daily basis, they may not react as hysterically as someone like me or you. They will probably be a lot more level-headed and react accordingly in an emergency situation. However, in this case, Robert actually did not attempt any life-saving measures such as CPR despite being a trained first responder who should know how to do CPR until police arrive. He did not attempt to save her life at all. So sure, you can say that he was a first responder and that's how he remained so calm. But if that's the case, then why didn't he act the way he was trained to? He apparently found that his soon-to-be wife shot herself minutes before the 911 call. He was calm and collected enough to explain to the dispatcher what happened, but not enough to think on his feet and decide to jump into action to save her life. That does not make any sense. You can also argue that maybe he was level-headed enough to see the gunshot wound and know that there was no saving her, but again, I don't care who you are, how well trained you are, what your job is. When you find your significant other or anyone you love unresponsive, especially if you know they were shot literally seconds ago, you are going to act irrationally. It doesn't matter if it's a headshot or anywhere else or even if they don't have a pulse and are not breathing. If your loved one is lying there unresponsive, especially if you're trained at CPR, you are going to at least attempt CPR. CPR, even if you feel like it's not going to work. But again, Robert didn't even try. After this 911 call, Creve Corps police arrived shortly after. When speaking with Robert about what happened, Robert told police that Grace had been pregnant but suffered a miscarriage and she was upset that Robert wasn't interested in trying for another baby. So, she had been really depressed in the weeks prior, leading to her taking her own life. He said that he was in the living room while Grace had been in the bedroom. Grace came into the living room and gave Robert a hug and then went back into the bedroom without speaking to him. Shortly after that, he heard a single gunshot coming from the bedroom. Immediately, he ran over to her and found her lying in the bedroom with blood pooling under her head. After the initial police officers arrived to the scene, it took two hours for the detectives to arrive. After examining Grace's body and the scene, she was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found that Grace died from a single gunshot wound to her head, which she sustained on the left side of her temple. Using this information and pretty much no other information, the medical examiner quickly ruled that Grace's death was, in fact, a suicide. Now, to make matters about the whole situation worse, Grace's twin sister, Laura, didn't even find out about Grace's death until someone messaged her on Facebook asking if it was true that her sister died. And then, after receiving this horrific news, Laura finds out that her death was apparently a suicide. This really confused Laura because Grace has never shown any signs of being suicidal. Yes, it can happen sometimes that your loved one can be depressed and suicidal and you have no idea. It does happen. 
but knowing what Grace has told her about the relationship, this just did not sit right with her. After police initially investigated the scene and spoke with Robert about what happened later that evening on July 22nd, Robert met back up with detectives at the Creve Corps Police Department with his lawyer to give an official statement. And at that time, Robert gave a completely different account of what happened that morning. Now, he was saying that he got up early that morning on the 22nd and was getting ready for work. He was in the closet stacking and organizing clothes. As he was doing that, Grace left the bedroom and came back, coming up to Robert to give him a hug. He tried to hug her back, but his arms were full with laundry. At that time, Robert told Grace that he needed to leave for work, so Grace moved over to his right side and gave him a side hug by pulling his face close to hers. As he turned around to start leaving, Grace said goodbye before Robert suddenly heard a gunshot. Like literally right behind him, still in that closet. Within arm's reach of Robert, Grace took out a gun and shot herself. After hearing the gunshot go off, he turned around and saw Grace fall to the ground, lying unconscious with blood coming from her head. Now, this story is just wild. He is saying that Grace decided to shoot herself literally a foot away from her fiancé right in front of him and he had no idea that she was about to do it. He didn't hear her grab the gun. He didn't hear her pull it back and go to shoot herself. He just heard the shot go off a foot away from him, turned around, and there she was lying dead on the ground. Then, despite being a trained first responder whose literal job is to save lives, he did absolutely nothing to help her. When speaking with police, he reported that the relationship he had with Grace was fine, but he did admit that he was having multiple affairs with different men and women behind her back. I do also want to note that at no time throughout him speaking with police did he explain why he was at the old house when he was at the new home just hours prior. That was never explained to this day. Before even reaching out to the family to get a better background or conducting a thorough investigation into Robert and Grace's circumstances, based on the autopsy alone, investigators ruled her death as a suicide. But Grace's family was not going to accept that answer without a fight. There was an investigation done into her death, which I will explain in just a minute, but her family found so many things wrong with how the whole investigation was handled. First, the medical examiner's ruling didn't make sense to the family. Like I said, her self-inflicted wound was to the left temple, and again, Grace was trained with firearms. She was right-handed and trained with guns using her right hand. It made absolutely no sense that she would suddenly decide to switch it up and use her left hand to shoot herself in the head. It makes more sense that someone who was right-handed stood on her left side and shot her while standing next to her. I want to note that in the whole story that Robert gave, he said that she came up to his right side and hugged him by pushing her head against his head. She was shot to the left side, so that would mean that her left side was on his right side. So, is that a coincidence? Probably not. The family also noted how Grace had numerous bruises all over her body that definitely indicate abuse, yet that wasn't even addressed in the autopsy report. At the scene, there was a pool of blood on the right side of her head, even though the gunshot wound was to the left side of her head. That could indicate that the body was moved or rolled over. That was never addressed. The investigators in the case never tested her or Robert's hands or clothes for gunshot residue. They also didn't test the gun itself for DNA, prints, or any other evidence though the police did respond to this allegation and said that testing the gun wouldn't have been useful anyways because they both had access to the gun and both would have had DNA on it. But even so, they can't just assume that they won't find anything if they don't even bother to try and test it. And even beyond that, again, they don't explain why they didn't test Grace's or Robert's hands for gunshot residue. 
They didn't even bother to look who actually shot the gun. They didn't take Robert's cell phone into evidence, giving the excuse that he needed the phone for work as if there's no possible way he could just get a new phone. Apparently, when Robert went into the police station to give his statement, there was a brief interview where police questioned him, but the video of that interview mysteriously got lost. Nobody can find it or what happened to it. Then it was found that Grace's engagement ring was missing. Family said that she had been wearing it all the time and would have been wearing it at the time of her death, and it was seen in the initial crime scene photos, but it went missing in the process of her going to the medical examiner, you know, them investigating the scene and her body being transported. It went missing in that process yet the police failed to even look into it. This is just scratching the surface of the mistakes made in the investigation, although to me, they may not actually be mistakes and more so professional courtesy given to Robert because this incident was being investigated by his police buddies. Then after Grace's death, they found several text messages that confirm just how volatile their relationship was and how abusive Robert was. Sometime in mid-2020, I believe in June, Grace found out that she was pregnant with Robert's child. Well, text messages show that all throughout that month, there were several times where Robert offered Grace $600 to abort their baby but she didn't want to. Other text messages show these huge mood swings from Robert where one moment he is throwing a fit, telling Grace that he doesn't love her and doesn't want to be with her, to then talking about moving in and how they are going to furnish their new home. On July 16th, 2020, Grace texted Robert, quote, I love you, please be safe. To this, Robert responded, I don't want to get married. I told you this over and over. All you do is keep pushing. Move on with your life. This is over. A few minutes later, Robert texted Grace, get out of my house. I don't want to be married. I don't want a baby. I don't want to live with your girls. I do believe there are more text messages sent, but Grace eventually ended the conversation by saying, I love you. Have a good first day back. Please be safe. To this, Robert responded, F off. That next morning, Robert asked Grace if she wanted to meet up with him and two other friends, pretending as if that intense and nasty conversation hadn't happened that previous night. They then started having a normal conversation where they discussed furniture and things like that. But then, Robert once again ended the conversation by saying, I absolutely cannot be with you. I'm not marrying you. You and your effing kids. F you. On July 19th, he texted her again saying, I asked you to leave several times. I don't want you there. He texted again a bit later saying, I don't want you or your kids. I want a way. I've asked you to leave. Take your Jeep, your things, and leave. I'm done. But then once again, later that day, he texts Grace and they talk about faucets that they're going to get for the new house as if he never told her to leave. On July 20th, Robert texted Grace again saying, I want you out of my life. He texted again later saying, you did nothing but ruin my first night staying at Conway. Going on to say, the thought of you sleeping in that house makes me want to vomit. That's how much I hate you. These conversations were wild and erratic with Robert switching between insults and expressing his hatred for Grace and how he didn't want to be with her to suddenly calmly discussing home furnishings and what they wanted to do with the house and inviting her to hang out and acting normal. It made no sense. And some people might say like, if this man is telling you to leave over and over and over again, why would you stay? but I'm sure parts of the conversation that we didn't see were him being nice and normal. And as we know, these conversations, again, were wild and erratic, and he was going back and forth between, you know, leave my house, I never want to be with you, thinking of you makes me want to throw up, to discussing what they were going to do at the house and inviting her to things and inviting her to see friends and things like that. It's very, very back and forth. It's very hot and cold. And I'm sure it was very confusing for Grace. But all of these messages show a crystal clear picture of a man who has little control over his emotions. Then, like I mentioned earlier, Grace's family were concerned over the fact that her engagement ring worth $20,000 was missing at the time of her death. Nothing was done about this at all until 2021 when police finally questioned Robert about the missing ring. In that interview, Robert tried saying that Grace gave the ring back to him, 
but text messages would prove that he gave the ring back to Grace. He also tried saying that Grace moved out of the home about a week before her death and took most of her things with her, but that wasn't true either. Then he tried saying that the ring was lost and that he filed a claim with insurance to report that lost ring, but he never provided police with any documentation to prove that he made this claim. I do also want to mention that apparently there were suicide notes found that Grace allegedly wrote to Robert and her children, but after reading them, her family does not believe that they were written by Grace the handwriting doesn't appear to be hers, and the wording and verbiage doesn't sound like her either, yet no investigation was done to see if she was even the author of these suicide notes. Due to all of these glaring inconsistencies and failures to even investigate Grace's death, her family filed a wrongful death suit against Robert. In the suit, they listed everything that I just talked about now, the text messages, the video recordings, how the gunshot wound itself doesn't make any sense, the lack of investigation, all of it. They alleged that Robert either drove Grace to suicide due to the emotional and physical abuse or that he was the one who killed her. But in response to the lawsuit, Robert denied all claims. For the years that followed, despite all of the glaring red flags and how suspicious this entire situation is, Grace's death remained as a suicide. And although the St. Louis Police Department announced that they were investigating the death, no arrests were made. And Robert was, and still is, free to live his life and do whatever he wants. Grace's family continues to be disturbed by Robert and his actions before Grace's death, during the investigation, and after her death in general. Robert never once reached out to the family to express his condolences or even asked them to be a part of the funeral. Then, as soon as she died, Robert cut off all contact with Grace's kids, who had been in his life and literally in his home for four years. He wanted nothing to do with Grace, her family, or his would-be stepchildren. But through all of this, Robert did manage to start a new relationship with another woman, 39-year-old Sarah Sweeney. Sarah Sweeney was born November 2nd, 1984 to parents Stephen and Teresa Sweeney, and she was originally from West Virginia. At the age of six years old, Sarah was diagnosed with Perth's disease. Perth's disease is a rare condition that affects mostly children between the ages of 3 and 11 years old, where the blood supply to the head of the femur is disrupted, which can cause necrosis. This can result in pain, difficulty walking, and limited mobility of the hip joint. This condition can be treated with surgery to change how the femoral head fits in the socket so that the child can live a normal, active life free of pain. I am not sure what treatment Sarah got for her condition, but it seemed like she was able to live a normal life. Sarah graduated from East Forsyth High School in 2003 before attending North Carolina State University, graduating in 2007 with a degree in microbiology and biological sciences. After that, she went on to attend Barry University for Podiatric Medicine and Surgery in Miami, Florida, where she received her doctorate in Podiatric Medicine in 2012. She completed her residencies in Miami before moving to Texas for a few years. After that, she ended up in St. Louis, Missouri. There, she opened up her own practice in Creve Corps. Sarah's family describe her as being vibrant and outgoing. She loves animals, art, and music, and she was a talented pianist. She also had a love for purses, fashion, and jewelry. She was also a dedicated Christian who wanted to set an example for others that hard work, faith, and perseverance can overcome any obstacles. Not long after moving to St. Louis, Dr. Sarah Sweeney was working in the emergency room when she met Robert Dawes. After meeting, the two started a relationship, and sometime in 2021, the two moved in together in the house that Robert originally lived in with Grace on Conway Drive in Creve Corps. After that, the two became engaged. After announcing their relationship and Sarah's family getting to know more about who she was engaged to, they started finding the articles about how he was suspected of being involved in his ex fiance's death. Her family started sending her links to the articles to warn her, 
but at the time, it seemed that Sarah either didn't want to leave Robert or couldn't. And I'll get more into that in just a minute. However, by November of 2021, Sarah's family were concerned when she stopped answering messages from her mother and stepfather altogether. Unlike Grace, whose family were close by, Sarah lived in a different state than the rest of her family. So, if she was being controlled or abused, there was really no way for her family to notice the signs. The only big sign they noticed was her lack of contact starting in November of 2021. But even then, Sarah's mother would later say that she was a grown adult. She was a doctor and had her own life, so they didn't know what to do. They couldn't force her to talk to them or stay in contact with her family. But things took yet another devastating turn on January 13th, 2024. By 6.39 a.m. that morning, Robert Dawes called 911 to report that his fiance, Sarah, suddenly died in their home. Shortly after, police responded to the scene where they found 39-year-old Sarah dead in the home that she shared with Robert. According to what police have stated in their reports, Sarah was alone in the hours leading to her death and there were no obvious signs of trauma when they first examined her. After finding her body, she was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy where they found that she had died of an overdose caused by a cocktail of different drugs in her system. The ME listed her death as oxycodone, gabapentin, and diphenhydramine, or better known as Benadryl, intoxication. So, she died from intoxication from all of those drugs being in her system. Her manner of death is currently listed as undetermined. Of course, after her death was announced, her family was devastated. Not only that, but those who supported Grace were also devastated. The family's lawyer released a statement saying that the family is deeply saddened by the death of another young woman involved in Robert's life, and they hope that, unlike Grace's case, the police in the area do an actual investigation. However, after Sarah's death, her family did announce that she actually has two different life-threatening diseases, which may have actually contributed to her death. Like I said, she was diagnosed with Perth's disease as a child, but she also had been diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome as an adult. Now, mast cells are blood cells in your body's immune system that help you fight infection, but they are also involved in allergic reaction. In someone with MCAS, their mast cells release an inappropriate amount of chemicals, such as histamine, into the body, causing allergy-like symptoms among a wide array of other symptoms. So, someone with MCAS will suffer from repeated episodes of allergic reactions with symptoms such as wheezing, itching, rashes, sweating, headaches, low blood pressure, and fainting. This condition has no cure, but it can be treated with various medications. While MCAS in itself isn't necessarily fatal, it can cause a severe allergic reaction called anaphylaxis, which can be fatal if it isn't treated immediately. I have also seen a lot of reports where the family's lawyer referred to Sarah's Perth disease as also a fatal condition, but as far as I know, it's not fatal and most people do recover fully from it. It's not life-threatening and even though recovery could take a few years for the bones to regrow and return to normal, most people will recover and live normal lives. I could be wrong, I haven't worked with anyone with PERDS, I've only heard about it in school, so if anybody knows differently, please correct me in the comments. But as far as I know, Sarah having PERDS at 6 years old would not affect her death at 39 years old whatsoever. If anything, it's much more likely that her MCAS led to her death. So as of right now, we don't know her official manner of death. I don't think it's been stated why she was taking all of those medications. We don't know if they were all prescribed to her. We obviously don't even know how much she took. Obviously, the antihistamine, Benadryl, being in her system, that makes absolute sense. I would think that she probably took a daily antihistamine to keep her MCAS symptoms under control. I do also want to note that we cannot say for sure whether or not Sarah suffered an anaphylactic shock before her death that may have caused her death. 
as far as the research that I have done, I don't think there's a way to diagnose anaphylaxis post-mortem, though sudden death from anaphylaxis is rare. So, as of right now, we truly cannot say for sure. But what we can say for sure is that before Sarah's death, she too was afraid of Robert. So, going back to November of 2022, Sarah was previously working for a company called Best Foot Forward before quitting and starting her own practice. However, the reason she quit is because, according to her, she faced gender discrimination, disability discrimination, sexual harassment, as well as insurance violations while working at Best Foot Forward. She said that she wasn't paid in full or consistently for her work. She had to take out a devastating amount of medical loans for her illness because of insurance issues. So, after leaving, she filed a lawsuit against her former employer. In response, Best Foot Forward filed a countersuit which stated that Sarah's physical and mental health are key issues in this case. In the process of filing the suit and gathering information to support their claims, they subpoenaed several people, including Robert and friends of Sarah's. One of the key pieces of information they obtained was a very lengthy message that Sarah sent to one of her friends at Best Foot Forward asking for her support, asking her to do the right thing. In that lengthy email, she writes about how she is afraid of Robert, calling him a scary murderer. I will read parts of that email to you now. She wrote, quote, All I ask is that you do the right thing in your heart. I am devastated to know that the one person who I knew I could count on and who I knew would be there for me, Sherry, has seen all of our texts and how you and I were scared but promised to stick up for each other and how you said you didn't want to quit and leave me alone to keep working there. I'm hurt, not mad. She writes about how her boss has filed a countersuit and says that she probably will lose and likely will be embarrassed by him and the whole thing and that her lawyer will be be embarrassed because she will be made out to be a liar. She continues, I've been homeless. I've had to move in with my boyfriend, the murderer, which has been scary at times. I've lost every penny and closed out my savings account. I've had issues with getting a job because of my past affiliation with him. I've suffered awful medical stuff because no health insurance. I lost wages when I worked hard for his ass. I have fought the urge to redacted. I have been through the ringer. She goes on to write about how she lost her car insurance so she can't get an inspection done, which means that she can't get it registered. She talked about how she can't get an apartment of her own because she's been kicked out of her apartment in the past. People who have read the email are concerned that it is a chilling echo of how powerless and helpless Grace also felt while in a relationship with Robert. Again, we don't know too much about Sarah's situation with Robert. We know that she was dealing with a lot of other things, but we can see that she felt like she had little control over her life, her finances, or even her job. In the counterclaim that Best Foot Forward filed, they also mentioned that Sarah told her boss that Robert was abusive and that she thought he killed his previous girlfriend. So again, as we can see, it appears that Sarah was concerned about the allegations against Robert. She confided in a few friends and her boss that Robert was abusive. Again, we don't know her official manner of death, and I don't know how much more can be done in the autopsy to determine just how she died, but what we can do is find out what was she prescribed. Was the oxy and gabapentin hers, or maybe was it Robert's? How much did she take? How did she take it? Because with this part of the case, it's obviously incredibly suspicious and very concerning that yet another one of Robert's fiancés is now dead. Literally two women died in his home within the span of four years. That is incredibly concerning. So that alone should put even more pressure on detectives and the authorities to fully investigate this case. When it comes to Grace, I personally believe, and this is just my opinion, I do not think she killed herself. I think there is so much evidence to show that Robert is responsible, and the evidence I included isn't even all of it. There's still so much more going on behind the scenes in terms of Robert's police buddies not doing their jobs and possibly even covering for him. I think the evidence, the lack of investigation, speaks for itself. Hell, Robert's own behaviors speak for themselves. So, 
let's just put that out there. Now, if Sarah's case happened alone, like if Grace's situation never happened, she never died, she never dated Robert, whatever, I would say that there's a good chance at this point in time that Sarah may have died from an accidental death or even suicide. Sarah was dealing with a lot. She was losing so much and was in the middle of this very intense lawsuit. She said herself, she thinks that she's going to lose the lawsuit and be embarrassed. She had already lost tons of money and was in a massive hole from her medical bills and everything else happening in her life. On top of that, she is stuck with an abusive boyfriend who she is afraid of and has to live with because she can't afford her own place. I can see how all of that can build up and be too much for someone to handle. And maybe she decided to take all those pills and end her own life. On the other hand, she also has this illness that can be fatal if not treated properly. We know that she didn't have health insurance, and according to her lawsuit, she wasn't getting the proper medical treatment for her condition. That being said, it's absolutely possible that something happened, she went into shock, and she died from that. Those two possibilities are absolutely plausible. However, the fact that Sarah was dating Robert, someone who she said was abusive, who she was afraid of, who we can pretty confidently say probably killed his ex, that makes me question everything. When a man has two significant others die, it's never a coincidence, especially when they are young and die suddenly and so close to one another. At this time, we don't know enough about Sarah's death to say for sure, but it certainly does not look good. Robert is either a psycho who, after getting away with the first murder, decided to murder another girlfriend, or he is the absolute unluckiest man who has ever walked the earth, having two girlfriends die within four years of one another, both either killing themselves or one of them dying suddenly. Or he did kill his first girlfriend and happens to have a second girlfriend that dies of an illness or by suicide. And still, even if that's the case, he is the unluckiest guy in the world. I don't know which one to pick. Because you don't want to think that someone can be so stupid that they would kill two significant others within just four years. Because Sarah's death has definitely revamped people's interest in the case and has made investigators look even more closely at him. If he just hid under the radar for years and years, maybe the heat would eventually be off of him and he could get away with it. But at the same time, he has proven himself to be unstable, erratic, and blows up at tiny things, so I don't put this past him to do the same thing twice. As for them dying in different ways, I don't think anybody is stupid enough to kill both fiancés with guns. That literally is the dumbest thing that you can do, so even though Sarah died of an overdose while Grace died from a gunshot, I don't think that means that Robert is any less suspicious. After Sarah's death, investigators have said that they're still looking into both deaths and have labeled both as suspicious. So, at this point, after everything we've discussed, I can only hope that they do this case justice and will finally put the effort in to investigate. I hope that other agencies look into Grace's case and that the family gets the answers and justice that they so greatly deserve. It's been four long years of this and her family is still fighting for her every single day. They deserve answers. They deserve to have an outside agency look at this case so that Robert's buddies aren't investigating one of their own. But as of right now, that is all of the information I have on this case. To summarize, I do think that Robert killed Grace, allegedly, and I think it's possible that he killed Sarah, but we need a hell of a lot more information before anybody can say what happened with confidence. But that is what I think, and now I want to hear your thoughts. What do you think about all of this? What do you think happened to Grace? Do you think the local police are covering for Robert and are purposely messing up the investigation? What do you think of Sarah's death? Do you think Robert will ever be charged with either woman's death? 
Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Also, make sure you head to the link down below and use code RACHEL55OFF to save 55% on your first month of Scentbird. Make sure to follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.